We are filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive in Los Angeles. My name is Monk Rowe. I'm pleased to have veteran musician Bob Hardaway with me. Thank you. You know, it's a long way from Milwaukee. That's where you came from? I was born in Milwaukee, yes. Yeah. Did you stay there very, did your family stay there? Uh, very long? We left when I was uh, three years old. I couldn't find a rhythm section. <laughs> Good one. Good one. I like that. And so we came out here and have been out in this general area. Okay. So you're time. really almost a native yes, of California. Yes, indeed. indeed. Yeah. What did your parents do when they came out here? Well, my father was a uh, cartoonist. Mm -hmm. And he was working uh, on the Kansas City Star for a while. And then he went to a newspaper in Milwaukee that I don't recall the name of. <clears throat> but he was actually a, polit a, a political cartoonist. And I have some of those uh, you? drawings, great. which are wonderful to have. And then he came out here and he got into the uh, cartoon business because a friend of his offered him a job out here who had an independent cartoon company. And this person's name was Ub Iwerks. And uh, he became very well-known and famous. As a matter of fact, he won an Academy Award for uh, special effects on the movie The Birds. Do you remember that movie? Certainly. That, that Hitchcock, Hitchcock movie? yeah. Well, he's the one that figured out how it looked like there was all those birds when there really weren't all those birds. Oh, neat. And uh, he also is the one that put together the Mr. Lincoln uh, uh, display, I guess you'd call it, uh, at uh, Disneyland, where he, uh, they have a, a thing that, it's a, uh, it's a dummy that is, looks like Lincoln, and it does the Gettysburg Address with mm -hmm. motions and all. He, figured that one out way, way back. At any rate, he eventually became the uh, the uh, special effects, head of the special effects department at Disney. Mm -hmm. And he passed away quite some time ago. Anyway, he gave my father his first job, and from there my father went then to Warner Brothers, where he originated one of the country's most famous cartoon characters, which was Bugs Bunny. No kidding. Yep. His name was Bugs Hardaway. That was his name. The boat he was named after him. Oh. And so he did that for uh, at uh, Looney Tunes, Mary Melody cartoons at Warner Brothers. And how old were mm. you when Bugs Bunny was invented? Uh, let's see. Bugs had his. I was. Let's see. How would I old would I've been? I think he had his sixtieth birthday. And I'm seventy, so okay. I must, must have been about ten, I guess, thereabouts. Do you have any memory of your father talking about this thing I'm working on at, at, at work, you know? And well, it, what happened was they had a cast of, of cartoon characters. One of them was a rabbit. I believe it was called Oswald. And it was a conventional rabbit. I mean, it, its ears hung down and it went on all fours. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to update this character somehow, so the cartoonists all submitted their suggestions and ideas. And it turned out that my father's was the one that was selected. And so Mel Blanc, the famous voice person, mm -hmm. um, they, they were going to call it the Happy Rabbit originally. Mm -hmm. And Mel said, and he, he's quoted this in his book also, that uh, said, well, why don't you name him after the guy that drew him? Call him Bugs, after Bugs Hardaway. So that's the true story. And that's cool. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Yeah. Now they have all these, you know, cells are? Yes. That the animation cells? Mm -hmm. Well, those were so plentiful and common when I was a kid that I didn't think a thing about it. Oof. And I don't have any. Oh. And they were around all the time. Yeah. And they're very valuable now. Mm -hmm. The original is very expensive. And I don't have any of those. That's too bad. Yeah. Yeah. But, you wouldn't know. Yeah, it's funny when you think about what, what your parents do, that sometimes it doesn't have significance until You take years it for later. granted. Right. You know, because I was always exposed to it. Yeah. <laughs> Through that, uh, I actually met uh, the musical He went from there to, to uh, Walter Lance, and he was very inf influential in bringing about Woody Woodpecker as well. And if you think about it, they're pretty much the same characters, yeah. both smart alecks, yeah. you know. <clears throat> and um, so he, I met the musical director of the cartoons at, you know, at uh, Walter Lance. His name was Daryl Cocker. And he became a mentor to me and mm -hmm. gave me some 
education and help. I was interested in writing for a while, and <coughs> he was helping me with that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that was all good. Yeah. It's all good stuff. How did the saxophone become your instrument of choice? Well, I started on, on a little piano, and then I started on the clarinet when I was 10 years old. And I played that for about five years, and then I heard Coleman Hawkins play Body and Soul. And I thought, that's for me. Uh -huh. So I got a tenor saxophone. And, and that was, I was, I started rather late for a lot of people. I was, I was 15. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, people start early in that these days. Yeah. But that's the way I got into the saxophone. So 15, and you were born in, in 1928, 28, 28, right? Uh -huh. So the music around the house and off the radio mostly consisted of, of what? Well, you, you didn't really have much jazz. You had some remotes because some of the bands were still happening then. Right. And you'd have remotes from some different uh, ballrooms and things throughout the country that some of them I could get. And I would hear some of that. And then, of course, I would go to see them when they came to Los Angeles at mm -hmm. the half of four or five different places they were playing in. I, I got in, when I got into, first time I went on the road was one year after I started the saxophone. Oof. And, uh, well, I knew how to read music already yeah. from the clarinet, so uh -huh. that was half the battle there. And, um, and I was 16 then, that first time I went on the road. And uh, that was uh, a beginning that started uh, 20 years yeah. about uh, traveling off and on. I wasn't on the road all the time because I was right. back going to school and different things. Uh, but off and on, I did the road for about 20 years. How did your parents feel about this, what seemed to start a career for you? Did they were supportive. Mm -hmm. They were. Uh, my, they were concerned when the first time I went on the road, you know, at 16, and uh, and my father gave me a talk about girls, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it was th the war was still on. Then. You see this because this was 1944. Yeah, and uh, and things were in short supply. Certain things, and one of them were white dress shirts, and I needed them for this which I didn't have because I never had jobs before, you know. So my mother went all over and ended up finding me six white shirts, but one here, one there, and oh, whatever. Wow. And uh, they were quite concerned when they packed me up and sent me away. Yeah. Who was that with? It was a local band named Chuck Cabot. Uh-huh. Uh, and he was a, uh, actually he was a, uh, also he was a coach uh, at a high school. And his brother was Johnny Richards. The writer? Yes. Yeah, okay. At his, the family name was uh, Ca uh, Cascalis, actually. Oh. And uh, that was the first time I went on the road. Yeah. The first time I was ever exposed to any sort of racial prejudice as well. How was, so? It was at that time. Well, <clears throat> we only had one black person on the band, and he was mm -hmm. the jazz tenor player. And I was the subordinate player. Second tenor. Se second, second tenor. And. Um, and uh, we got to Spokane, Washington, where we were going to play at the Natatorium Park Ballroom. And they didn't allow any black people in the, ball, in the park. And he had family up there. Mm. It was quite an eye-opener for me. I, had, I, I just hadn't been exposed to it before, you know. And, uh, but also, in a way, the band leader was very cheap. So he didn't get another player. We played with four saxophones, and I became the jazz tenor player. In other words, they didn't even let the musician come in either. No. Oh, I thought. Oh no, 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 no! He couldn't even come in the park. Oh, what an awful scene that it was. Be. It was terrible. Yeah. Emotionally, it was terrible for him and for me. And, and his family, like. Yes, oh. indeed. But we had he had some of us over to his house, his family's house, you know, and all. Yeah. And. Um, so anyway, but then I was put into the hot seat yeah. and had to get my feet wet right away. <laughs> we'll just pause for our coffee here for a moment. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, I thought, you know, sometimes uh, sometimes the black musicians could play, but the black audience could But that's true. Remember, that's sometimes yeah. that was the case. Right. He was a local player, too. I think his name was Walter Benton. And uh, he... I heard about him for a few years, but then I didn't, so I don't know what became of him. So you got thrown into the 
solo tenor chair. That's indeed Did, the case. Had you done much uh, improvising uh, before that? A little bit. I liked Benny Goodman uh -huh. when I was playing the clarinet. And my neighbor across the street played the drums. <clears throat> and uh, we'd get together and do Benny Goodman and Gene Krupa. Just the two of us. <laughs> so, I had, you know, I had yeah. a little bit. But I didn't have, at, at that point, I had just started studying harmony. In high school, I started studying harmony. And that turned into a, a long, many-year study that I spent a lot of time studying in different, starting from scratch twice, mm -hmm. three times, actually. Uh, and so I got a pretty thorough foundation in harmony, and uh, which helped a whole lot. Because I had a average or a little, maybe just a little bit better than average ear. I didn't have a great ear. Mm -hmm. And so I had to use my head as much as my ears to play. Yeah, so if, if you saw E minor 7, in your chart, mm -hmm. you kind of knew what to do with that. Exactly, no. I knew exactly, I knew exactly what, what to do with it. Oh, yes. Good. I, okay. I know a lot about harmony <laughs> <laughs> and relationships of one chord to the other. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but if I was have to depend on my ear entirely, I wouldn't do nearly as well if, if without the paper, you know. Mm -hmm. Although I have done a lot of that too, but usually it's material that I know well. Uh, it's an advice that I think is good for students sometimes. If, if you have some of each, mm -hmm. your rate of success could be yeah. higher. Things were really different when I started at Two Monk. Uh, it, it, if you had one saxophone player in a band in those days that could improvise, that's about all you had. Mm -hmm. Or in any section. But nowadays, with the education system has been so improved, mm -hmm particularly with professionals teaching it, and not just educators teaching it, but really professionals that know right. what they're talking about, clinics and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. that everybody now can play. And in fact, it's, it's unusual if somebody can't play yeah. a, good, a good jazz solo. Right. Over the years, did the, um, the solo player get a little more salary? No, not in my case. That never happened with me. I never, I, I was always happy to have the job and, and didn't really try to, <laughs> yeah. to get extra money. I, I, try to push it. Um, you went from, what's this, around 43, you said? 44 is when I first went on the road, okay. yeah. A lot of service, a lot of musicians were in the service. True. Did that have an effect on, I mean, is that why you got this job, the, do you think? Well, this was pretty much a young band. Oh. This was mostly kids, you know, about okay. my age. Yeah. There was, I think the oldest guy in the band was uh, a guy named uh, John, Johnny Polanski. And I think he was 19. And I think he was the oldest guy in the band. I mean, he got kids, you know. I see. Because we didn't make very much money. <laughs> and uh, John Polanski ended up having a terrific career. His, his name became John Parker. And he did a lot of film work. He did, uh -huh. he did a lot of music for a lot of television series and motion pictures. <clears throat> he did very well. But uh, uh, that was that was the beginning of it, and that uh, sort of got me hooked. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of humorous story. I was very very uh, naive and all at that time, in most every way. And the first night at the well, we, when we opened. We, uh, five of us were sharing this two-room hotel because of the money. And, uh, and they, they got a couple girls to come up to the room. You know these guys? Uh -huh. Gee whiz, you know. <laughs> and so I went out, left the next day, and got, went to the Y. True story. <laughs> <laughs> You remembered what your father said. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Watch be careful. <laughs> Something's going to happen, and he was right. <laughs> That's sort of fun, though. So 1946, um, did you decide to enlist? I did enlist, yes, yeah. indeed, I did. And uh, what happened was I went to the um, uh, Air Force. I was going to listen in the Air Force. And the day we were being inducted, there was a band from San Diego, young band. At this time, Look Magazine had a band contest, 
throughout nationwide. Mm. And this band placed third, I think, in it, in the nationwide from San Diego. And so they were inducted as a unit. <coughs> they enlisted as a unit. Mm. And there was, they were told that they would stay together and be stationed at West Overfield, Massachusetts and play for recruiting purposes and entertainment, USO type things. Yep. Uh, the, the baritone player and the tenor player from that band didn't pass the physical. <laughs> and it happened to be that my friend who was a baritone player, and that is actually the reason I was enlisting because I, I was gonna be drafted anyway since so I thought we'd stay together. Yeah. So we enlisted together and we joined that band. It's just a coincidence that it worked out that way. Well, they were not used for recruiting purposes, and my friend ended up in in uh, Newfoundland, and I went with a good part of this band to Panama. Oh, it's a long way from Massachusetts. <laughs> long ways from Massachusetts, <laughs> but uh, that was turned out to be a very good experience too, because in Panama I, I started studying privately from a musician down there, studying harmony and counterpoint. And uh, I wrote a library for that band as a young person, mm -hmm. as I was. And, um, uh, and we, we did a show that toured the Caribbean era, area, Haiti and Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and a bunch of different places mm -hmm. down there, which I was the conductor of this, this band, mm -hmm. you know, and, and had written most of the music. <clears throat> so I thought that was going to be a start of something for me. And then I, when I got out of the service, I went to <clears throat> junior college in Los Angeles. And actually, I wanted to go to uh, Eastman, and I made application. There was a two-year wait at that time. Oh. So I didn't want to wait, so I got started. And uh, I started studying harmony yet a third time from the very beginning. Oh. So it was easy for me. I guess. Yeah. You know, Straight A's, I, right? <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. But I wouldn't have missed it for the world, mm -hmm. having it taught to me like, like that. Yeah. And uh, so I did that for a couple of years and then went to a private uh, school called American Operatic Laboratory, which I was studying composition there with a particular guy. I went there because this, he was approved by the, by, uh, the veterans. Oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, and um, and he, there was a well-known composer teaching there, so I studied a bit with him. But actually, I, I had to make a choice before I went there, because uh, I didn't feel I had an, enough talent to be a, a Jerry Mulligan who could write and play, or an Al Cohen who could write and play the way I like to write and play, mm -hmm. or a handful of others, Bill Holman. And so I chose the playing. I decided I'd let the writing forget it and, mm -hmm. and be a player, so that's when I started really trying to apply myself to that. Yeah, it's interesting because other, other fellows have, have had similar decisions, like you mentioned Bill Holman, and, and he went the other way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, well, he had a quite a good career playing, yes, though, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to just backtrack for a moment. In the service, he, you said that uh, when you were with this band in 43, you saw your first instance of uh, mm -hmm. segregation and so forth. Yes. What was the service like in that regard? The same. Um, uh, we took basic training in Texas. And uh, we mentioned something about that earlier. Yeah. About uh, they, there's some problems there. And, uh, <clears throat> and the, the people were segregated pretty well. I think they had black units and all. Mm -hmm. There was a black piano player that uh, we didn't have a piano player, actually. I forget how that worked out, but uh, <clears throat> but so he played with us. No, I know what it was. Uh, the piano player that was with this group uh, really wasn't a jazz player, and we wanted to play sometimes. So we, there's this black piano player would play, we'd play with him, but he mm -hmm. was he, he was in a, a different area from us entirely. Mm -hmm. I you know I didn't have to. I didn't see anything blatant at that time. Yeah. You know. But it was it was pretty well in place. Yeah. Yeah. I, th yeah, I think so. So, you got into big bands when the big band era 
had had its at, real popular at, at, run. At the very end. But there was enough, it was still going on enough that it you was, could find work. Yeah, there were still some ballrooms, and uh -huh. uh, this was before the era of every band was a ghost band. Oh, yes. Yeah. Every band has a right. ghost leader now, and, right. was, and maybe more than one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You know? <laughs> How many Benny Goodman's tributes have there been? Yes. Well, they can't say the Benny Goodman band. That's against the... Yeah. They could but they have to say a tribute mm -hmm. to. Like it, I'm sure Abe told you that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He just did one in Japan recently. Uh-huh. But, um, but there were still some bands. I, their first uh, uh, so-called name band, I, I played with a few bands, yeah. uh, panic sort of bands. First name band I played with was Ray Anthony. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think it was 51, I think. I lose track a little bit, but I, it was either 51 or 52. That's close enough. And he was very hot at the time. He was about the last one that made it. One of the other guy, bands that made it for a while, didn't last as long as Ray, was uh, Cy Zentner. Got a band. I was on that band as well. Mm -hmm. But those, the rest of the bands were just rehashing the, you know, with Glenn Miller and, and, uh, Tommy Dorsey and yeah. things. How did the bunny hop come a, come around? Oh, I, I don't know. Ray, Ray has his. It's supposedly his tune. Yeah. You know, and <clears throat> uh, it seems like Ray would uh, jump on whatever bandwagon was hot. Uh huh. And if a hit record came out, he'd try to make something similar only actually f patterning it exactly almost after what was the hit. He, I, see, I saw him do that many times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm not sure how the buddy, they were doing it when we were on the band. Okay. And uh, also one of his other sticks he used to do is the band used to walk single file through the audience and around the rooms and the ballrooms playing the, the Saints. Uh -huh. And the first night I joined the band, we left from here uh, going to Las Vegas, excuse me, went from Las Vegas going to, uh, to uh, Salt Lake. And there was an accident. The band had an accident. The driver drove into a culvert and threw, most, nobody was seriously injured, but threw everybody out of their seat. Oh. Kind of broken noses and... First, went, your first night? My first night. Oh, great. And I was n unknown, so I didn't know anybody. And this band was pretty well organized. Mm -hmm. They'd been together a while. And so I was in the very back of the bus with the, they had a rack with the clothes that could hang across the back. And I was the seat right in front of that, and all the clothes came on me. <clears throat> and one of the guys, the guy broke his nose, he's, he's bleeding over his wife. <laughs> and, and, and the singer who was so upset that he soiled his pants. I mean, oh, he got so, yeah, great. you know. Yeah. And so then there was pictures, there was a picture of, uh, in the next month's a downbeat. Uh, when we were, we had, from there we went up up north to uh, Oregon, Portland, and there was a picture up there. And here's the band on the bandstand. Here's all these people bandaged, you know, the guy with a patch over his nose and, and the guy's shoulder bandaged up and things. And so some of the guys didn't have to walk then for the saint if they. Oh, I see. So they, they were able to get out of that a little bit. But that's sort of fun. They gave him a dispensation from yeah. the head. <laughs> Jeez. Got him off the hook temporarily. Wow. <laughs> I spent uh, quite a number of years, though, off and on, uh, 40 years off and on, working for Ray. Mm -hmm. He didn't travel all the time, and, and he had a small group for a while. Mm -hmm. I did that and did some touring South America and things, and <clears throat> had, had quite a long relationship with that man that started back in, I guess, it was 51. Yeah. Was the... Um, the bunny hop was something that came out from someone else, and he covered it. Or was well, it his no, thing? I no. The bunny hop was his. It was his thing. He, yeah. he's, he's 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 credited as being the composer, and uh, he you know he made a lot of money because he sold a lot of records of that. Yeah. But that dance was a certain thing that, you know, it was a a line dance. Right. Bop bop bop. Mm -hmm. You know how. Yeah, sure. <coughs> people would hop three times. Right. 
Isn't it people, curious? People seem to, well, they, it was a game like sort yeah. of. Yeah, you know, well, right. It was sort and of it, fun, I guess. It's, uh, every seems like every few years another one comes along. You yeah. Know, you, you had people doing that to uh, Alley Cat and uh, yeah. had the Macarena. And That's it, right. Some things never it's, change, it's, I guess. No, I guess. <laughs> We, tra we traveled, uh, uh, I was never on that band uh, for like year in, year out traveling. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, first I started subbing for a, a, a wonderful tenor player who passed away named Buddy Weiss. He was a wonderful tenor player. And, uh, but he had his problems with the drug abuse. Mm -hmm. And he would get in trouble every so often. And, and he'd have to leave the band and then I'd fill in for him. Then eventually he was not there anymore <clears throat> so I had the job but but then Ray wasn't traveling all the time either he was staying around just go out occasionally and yeah so were you establishing a, a career off the road uh, in, in the LA area yeah I played the clarinet and the saxophone and after by the time I was uh, 30 I thought I felt having heard a lot of players that I could play, uh, you know, a, at a par with them, but I wasn't getting any of the good work in town, any of the studio work, and I, I was trying to figure out why. Mm -hmm. So I decided uh, maybe I'd do better if I became a, a multi-doubler. So I was 30 at the time, and I took up both the flute and the oboe mm -hmm. at the same time and really applied myself to them. And uh, two years later, I got a job and the staff orchestra at NBC, they still had a staff orchestra mm -hmm. then, that was in the early 60s, yep. um, uh, as the oboe doubler. And I ended up then doing, having it all. You know, I had all the flutes, you know, the piccolo, the alto flute, the C flute, the bass flute. Oh, you even had a bass flute. Bass flute. Oh, wow. I still have it, and I, <laughs> but I used it four times or so. <laughs> right. That was because of, uh, well, let's see, who was it? Mancini was the one that made, Hank Mancini was the one that made the alto flute po mm -hmm. popular. And uh, so everybody had to have an alto flute then. And then he may have also have been the one that used the bass flute, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, I don't remember. But anyway, I also had the English horn and the oboe wow. and the clarinet and the bass clarinet and all the saxophones and... <laughs> and a small moving van. Yeah, well, the drag, <laughs> you know, the difficult part about choosing that direction was uh, it was rare when you'd know... I started doing calls then after that. Yes. After I got my staff job, then I started doing a lot of other calls as well. And uh, it, it was rare when you got a call that you knew what you were going to be expected of you. No kidding, they wouldn't tell you, bring your English horn and your alto flute. No, rarely. Hmm. They said the contractors, to protect themselves, would say, you better bring everything. Oh. So here I'd pack all this stuff in the trunk of my car, and you can imagine like 13, maybe 13 instruments to try to keep the, them at a recording level yeah. oh. of proficiency with reed instruments, you know, and particularly uh, that was hard work. I'd have to touch them all you know, almost daily. Mm -hmm. Maybe not really practice them, but at least put some air through them, you know? Yeah. Make sure they're, they're they playing work. right, that they yeah. work, yeah. You don't want to be on the, on the call and then all of a sudden, like, uh-oh, <laughs> yeah. the horn is not playing. Yeah, well, you wouldn't be back the next time. Mm. You know, they're very unforgiving. <laughs> wow. It must have been, just from a logistical standpoint, too, a picture like, leaving all those instruments in your car all day if you oh, didn't use them or oh, something, yeah. you know. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a problem. I had a, a, what they call a space blanket. It was like a, a thin, it looked like it's sort of like aluminum foil mm -hmm. with a, a, another kind of backing that would help to keep them from overheating. I, I put this over all these, these guys, you know. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so that was hard, that was hard work, but it it, uh, it paid well because doubling paid well, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> in particular in recording work, in, in uh, motion picture work, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, film, television work. 
it didn't, the doubling didn't pay as well in live television. I did a lot of live television work. I did a lot of, uh, <clears throat> during the 60s and 70s, uh, there was, there must have been eight or ten musical variety shows on the air. There was uh, Dean Martin, and Carol Burnett, uh, Sonny and Cher, Jack Benny, uh, Red Skelton, um, oh gosh, Danny Thomas had a show. Yep. Uh, this was before his comedy before show. Before the comedy he show, had a, yeah. He had a variety show. And, uh, and somehow I ended up on most of them. That became my most uh, busy field, actually. How did that work from uh, a, a setup standpoint? Where was the band in a, as opposed to the actors and actresses? Uh -huh. uh, in live television. Yes. Yeah, uh, usually. Uh, it, they were like on the side. Uh-huh. Uh, Carol Burnett, uh, <clears throat> uh, there was the audience. Here's, here's, here's the audience here, and here's the stage here, mm -hmm. and the band was right here, uh, budding onto the stage, but on the side of the audience, behind a glass. Uh, you could see the audience, but uh, it had glass up there to keep the sound, oh. some of the sound out. Uh -huh. And uh, on the Dean Martin show, <clears throat> Uh, which was a very popular show. Uh, it was, you could. It was similar, similarly set up, but you couldn't see the audience because it was like like oh. drapes in between you and the audience. <clears throat> they were all similar to that. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, I did a lot of the Dick Clark production shows as mm -hmm. well. Some of those, the band was on stage, actually on stage. Oh. Then there was a, the Laugh In show, which was another oh. terrific show. Uh, Did you guys ever have trouble keeping a straight face? On oh, some yeah. Of things? <laughs> <laughs> Laughing was great. Yeah, was I fun. have this really this specific memory. I don't know if you were on playing the Dean Martin show. You know, he'd always come on, jump on the piano. Yeah. And one time they had a pia collapsible piano. <laughs> yeah. Were you on this show then? Yeah, yeah sure. God, yeah, I, so I think the show was on 10 years, and, and I was on there seven. Uh -huh. And when the staff orchestra ended, then I left because I got a chance to do the Carol Burnett show, which was a, a better paying show. Uh -huh. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, had a, I had a tenor f solo on the theme of the Dean Martin show that was very prominent mm -hmm. and was heard throughout the country. And Les Brown was the band leader on the show. Uh -huh. And then he'd go on the road and they'd, they'd ask the tenor player if he was the one that played on the, and he wasn't, he wasn't even on the show. Oh. You know, if he played that solo, so uh -huh. it, it got a lot of exposure. Great. Yeah, it was good. It was nice. Do you get residuals for some of that work? Is that the right term? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, um, there are residuals on um, on live television. We have like six different contracts in the music business. We have uh, film, and we have TV film. I guess they're pretty much the same. Live television. We have uh, commercials. We have records. And this is one other. At any rate, the, 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 each one is a different contract. It has to be negotiated each time. Uh, now, on they, they've never got residuals on film work. In fact, we went on strike one time to try to get them. So in other words, any, all these television series, uh, dramatic series that you see, years later that are re-shown, uh -huh. you know, on cable and so forth, they'll show the whole series over again. Maybe right. it's 30 years old. Some of them are great shows, you know. Uh -huh. But the musicians don't get paid for that. Like uh, Gunsmoke, for instance? That's right. That's the idea. Yeah. That's right. That's the idea. Uh, but you get paid if it's, uh, you get paid like a, a in, in live television, you get what you call as a reuse payment. Mm -hmm. And so when it is replayed, the first time it's replayed, the show, it's 75% of the original. Hmm. And, then, and then the next couple times, I think it's 50%, and then it keeps reducing, uh, uh, being reduced until you're down to about 5%. Uh -huh. And then there's foreign reuse. If it's shown in a foreign market, then that's another payment, not nearly as substantial, mm -hmm. but it, there is some payment. Yeah. So it's always probably a kind of a little adventure when you get your statement and oh, yeah. say, what are they doing now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You probably say, oh, I played on that. Yeah, well, sometimes you have to go after it, though. Ah. 
you have to go after is it. that is that when you call the union is that your first call That's and what say you try, yeah and try well, to get them to help you yeah uh -huh. yep <laughs> can you recall any any memorable moments in all those live TV shows that stick stick out for you oh the, there was when uh, we were doing the Carol Burnett show, it was done at CBS called, uh, which is down at, well, you don't know the city, but it's down at Fairfax and Beverly, which is down uh, in, yeah, west, west Los Angeles, sort of, near, sort of near Beverly Hills. And they had uh, some soap operas that were done there also. And they had these sets that were set up permanently like a drawing room or that they re would reuse yeah. but, and they leave them set up permanently and they were fully uh, I guess you'd say decorated you know with things on the tables and yeah. everything and there were a couple guys that go, used to go sh uh, shopping on the breaks that were on the bands in the band and they'd steal things <laughs> and uh, uh, these same this, these same two people there was a restaurant we used to eat at on, on our breaks that we'd go to, and it, they had these huge pepper mills. They were about four, three, three feet tall, I guess, oh. or four, maybe. I mean, the, the waiter had to stand back from the table, you know, to, <laughs> yeah, do the... to make it to the salad or whatever he's putting in there. Well, he, he stole one of those, put it on their jacket, just walked out with it. Oh. And then uh, Carol Burnett would have wonderful Christmas parties you'd have them at the Los Angeles Yacht Club uh, and she'd hire name bands we had Basie's band one time this is for the cast and crew of the show you know wow. and a wonderful buffets you couldn't ask for better you know and there was this huge silver candelabra that somebody stole sure. and we I never found out for sure but we always suspected it might have been the <laughs> Our same kleptos, you know. Oh, gee, I've heard of some <laughs> bad habits in musicians, but well, I mean, you not know, that one. and it's these people were well to do. I mean, as far as musicians yeah. go, they had, they did well, uh -huh. and they did. It wasn't the money; it was the adventure, I guess. Yeah, that's strange. I, I you know, I'm sure there are, there are many. Uh, uh, like, for instance, doing, I can't give you specific instances, but uh, on Carol Burnett's show, um, Jonathan Winters was a frequent guest there, and he was just sensational. And he used to always love to come over to the band area and entertain the band, which he would do, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and uh, you know, that was, that was always fun. And, and that show was with uh, Tim Conway that was and Harvey Corman yeah that was as much fun as I ever had watching those guys work but Tim Conway would just completely destroy Harvey Corman Harvey Corman could not continue you know he'd just break him up so much uh -huh. it was a lot of fun you know? yes <laughs> that, that made the work a lot of fun I can't imagine how you guys uh, would keep playing without laughing well you know I'll tell you the way life almost all live television shows were done the same they were done in two days. You had a rehearsal and a pre-record the night mm -hmm. before, which you would pre-record most of the important music. I see. And then when the show was live, like they usually, had, in this one during this one period of time, there was almost always a, a chorus of maybe six singers, plus a dance uh, dance yeah. group, and they had musical numbers that were quite extravagant, and so those were sort of tricky. And so, so, th so the band had, didn't have to play them over and over and over again. They would pre-record them, because sometimes they'd have to be redone. And they would tape the show twice, uh, what they call a dress rehearsal, and then the so-called main show. Both of them had audiences. And then they would pick the best of the two. But most of the music was pre-recorded. Mostly mm -hmm. we'd just play a little do -do 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 play on or something, you know, mm -hmm. just a few bar, a couple bar incidental music. Occasionally there'd be a live number. We do the whole thing, but most of it was pre-recorded. So we, a lot of this time when all this wonderful stuff was going on uh, in the comedy, 
uh, we weren't actually playing. Oh. You know, so we could just sit there and enjoy it. You could know? be in the audience too. Yeah. 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 That was it must a, have kept quite a number of arrangers pretty busy too. Yes, it did. Yeah. Yeah, that was a very busy period, the 60s and 70s, uh, with live television. Unfortunately, the shows, almost all of them had pretty much the same format. There'd be the principal, like Dean or, or Carol Burnett or whoever, and then they'd have guests, and the, the principal would do their stick, and then they'd do bits with the guest, mm -hmm. and then there'd be the, with the musical numbers and whatever. So whenever somebody was come to town, uh, they would book them on four or five of these shows. Probably somebody that didn't live here. I see. And they were in town maybe for a week, and they'd book them on. And so they just overexposed mm. a lot of things, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. And so now there aren't any. Uh, there aren't any musical variety shows now. Yeah. I mean, you can't call the talk shows musical variety shows. Because they really aren't. Once, right. a, once in a while, they have a musical number, but it's far from the kind of background music that they had in those early yeah. shows. Were there certain people that would come in mm -hmm. as guests that of questionable musical talent that would try, you know, singing sure. or whatever? Yeah, I won't. I won't mention any yes. names. <laughs> and then, there's, surprisingly, there were some people that you had no idea that they were able to to do that. There was mm -hmm. a I didn't. There was a comic named Frank Fontaine. I remember him. He was on the Jackie Gleason show. Didn't he play the, the, the drunk? Yes, he did. Yeah. Indeed, he did. Yeah. And uh, he had a delightful voice, which I didn't know. Uh huh. Well, yeah, it's almost like a like an Irish tenor. Exactly. Right? Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. And I was really impressed with that. Uh huh. And actually, uh, as I recall, Telly Savalas sounded pretty good when he sang on the Carol Burnett show. He he, well, he he did a, he he did you know that deep voice and he sort of talked it a bit too, but I thought he did a quite an acceptable cool. job. Uh huh. And um, but there were those who uh, would uh, really have a very poor sense of pitch, and and would either sing a painfully flat or sharp, one or the other. But they were popular enough that uh -huh. they t accepted it, I guess, you know. Who are some of your other bandmates that are pretty well-known names now? Uh, you mean in the, in the television? The TV yes. The television field? Well, <clears throat> well when I went on staff at uh, NBC, uh, Conrad Gazzo was still there, and he was uh, famous, one of the most famous lead trumpet players and yep. number one in town for many years. And uh, Joe Howard, a trombone player, was also a top-rate trombone player. And, uh, <clears throat> and Carol Burnett show, uh, when Peter Matz, was, who was from New York, uh, became the band leader. I had known him when I was very young. When he was going to UCLA, I'd done some work with him. And, and when he was coming out here, he called me and asked me if I'd like to come on that show. <clears throat> and he had some formidable players on that that he brought out with him from New York. I see. Uh, Saul Gubin was a drummer, a mm -hmm. marvelous drummer. Bob Tricarico was a saxophone uh, bassoon specialist. And uh, Joe Soldo was a contractor, and he was a lead alto player. He, was, he played well as well, good flute player. And uh, Chauncey Welch, trombone player. Uh, George Roberts, famous bass trombone player, probably the oh, right. father of the bass trombone. Uh -huh. He was on uh, a lot of these shows, and uh, and Dick Knoll, another famous uh, uh, studio, but wonderful player, was on some of these as well. So there was a lot of people. Uh, uh, Les Brown had the staff rhythm section was former Les Brown people, so when he got that show, he was comfortable with them. Jack Sperling was the drummer, and Raleigh Bundock, who was with the original Glenn Miller Band. He was uh, and Tony Reese, the guitar player. So those are some of the names. Uh, <clears throat> there's not a whole lot of the people that, that during my big band experience of the, on the road that actually did make the make it across the line and uh -huh. into that. Now that did happen in the early days because the, the motion picture orchestras uh, were 
except for the string players, were largely filled out by, or a lot of the, them at least, were filled out by by the, the guys from the name bands yeah. that were famous mm -hmm. when the bands were famous. I mean, Abe came from that, and then he went on the staff at the, I think he was at Fox, I believe. Right. And uh, he was there for many years, and many people like that came from the big band. Well, then, then the big band era was over, and so they weren't coming from that ah. anymore, yeah. you know? And it was, as I said, just these ghost bands, which uh, didn't get the notoriety or the exposure. There were, air, air checks weren't happening anymore, uh, radio broadcast remotes from, from the different ballrooms, and the ballrooms weren't there even. What did you think about the, the advent of rock and roll when it came on? Uh, I didn't care much for it. It didn't uh, seem very challenging to me. Uh -huh. Did you get into positions where you needed to play? Yes. Some rock and roll yes. tenor. One of the things I did uh, quite a bit of was, uh, during one period of time, was records. Mm -hmm. And uh, was, they were pop records, which was, that was what it came from, was the rock field. And uh, I was never uh, called upon too often to be a soloist, even though I had become fairly adept at uh, being a jazz soloist. But uh, I never really tried to to play any other style mm -hmm. than what I played. You know, and that, uh, you have to accept me as I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did do a lot of record dates of uh, playing that kind of music. Mm -hmm. And those were usually uh, overdubs. Right. You know, the rhythm track is done, and then they put the voices on or whatever, and then they'd add a horn section. And uh, I did a lot of that playing, playing the baritone mostly on those. Mm -hmm. What kind of people do you recall? Oh, t t everybody. I, I'm, I'm not going to. I, sometimes I didn't even know who, I was, who it was. Oh, right. You know. You just put the headphones on. Yeah, because I didn't. Part. I didn't. I didn't. I must say I did it for the money. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, but there was good people to play play with, so that helped too. Right. First rate players. You know. Right. We maybe would have uh, uh, two trumpets and a trombone, and maybe two saxophones, but five horns maybe. And uh, we just did all kinds of things. One one time we did a, a thing with a small band. And it was a Japanese um, motion picture. And we had no idea at all what the picture was about. I mean, they weren't showing it on the screen or anything. We were just recording this music. And this Japanese promoter got in, in, the, in the booth, and we heard him say, pray back, please, pray back. And so we thought it was a religious picture, maybe. <laughs> And it turned out to be a Godzilla movie. No kidding. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. Oh, gosh. You, well, when you watch TV these days, every once in a while, do you, do you hear yourself? Occasionally. Yeah. Yeah, occasionally in some old, old pictures. And th they did re-show, um, they did, uh, the Laugh-In series was on six years. Mm -hmm. And they re, uh, sh that was re-shown over a period of eight months, five nights a week. And that was a, a, a very lucrative. Because those were the first re-showings. As, oh. as I told you, the percentages were way up there, you know, of, of your pay. And boy, that was terrific, you know. But I, you know, I, would, I, I loved the show anyway. Mm. And I would watch them as much as I could, and I could hear those. And uh, occasionally, all of a sudden, I'd say, hey, wait a minute, I think I did that. You know? yeah. At the time Laffin was on, were you, was there the sense of like I can't believe these guys are doing this now on TV some of the political stuff oh, they did. Oh yeah, yeah yeah oh well it was you know I think I would say I would say I think it would be as good today to watch as it was then because mm -hmm. the humor was humor and it was and what a great cast they had Goldie Hawn was just adorable mm -hmm. and she, she was very young then you know I think she was 20 at that time or something. Oh. And she was just adorable. And Artie Johnson and uh, Joanne Worley, those people were just, it was, it was a great show. It was a lot of fun. What a way to make a living. Well, <laughs> you, know, you know, I never did anything, uh -huh. uh, other kind of work uh, after high school. I worked, when I was in high school, I did a little other work, uh, but uh, I never did anything else except music, and I was able to make my living, and I was fortunate, because mm -hmm. that doesn't happen to very many people. Right. 
it's probably harder now even than it was then. I know that my friends, some of my younger friends now, really have to do a lot. I mean, do everything. You know, a little bit of theater, and then maybe maybe small community theater, which is a lower scale than, say, a place like yeah. the Schubert across the street, which has a great scale. If you get one of those jobs, that pays good money. Mm -hmm. And they have to do concerts with little orchestras, or they do dance gigs and whatever they can, you know? Do you know if the union has a uh, minimum requirement for people in the pits these days? Yes, they do. And I can't, th th and they vary. Mm -hmm. There's different contracts. There's uh, the Niederlander Corporation has some theaters, and then there's uh, other groups that have other theaters. And each one of those is a separate negotiation, also. Nice. And they have to go negotiate for the pit. And then another problem they have is when a traveling show comes in. It used to be that they'd have to have, they'd have to pay a certain number of local musicians, even though they didn't play. I mean that's because they were displacing jobs by bringing a, being a, bringing a traveling orchestra in. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not sure what's, I think that's different now. It's, that's, that's changed. I'm not, yeah. I've been out of that field for a long time. Uh, but when they bring the whole thing, or they bring a, uh, a track, the whole thing re recorded. Like, now, we started, we were picketing uh, just a couple months ago when the Rockettes show uh -huh. was here. And it appeared over at the Universal Amphitheater. And they had a completely recorded, taped music. Taped music for these people dancing. And part of the excitement is the is the live music, you know. I would think. But we lost. No kidding. Yep, yeah, we couldn't get anything done about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I noticed the uh, from where, and where we live that the shows will come in, and it's uh, the number of real live people in the pits is for those traveling shows is, is sunk to almost nothing. Mm -hmm. The electronics have replaced mm -hmm. people like crazy. Sure. Well, they, they usually do it without strings at all. Yeah. Just use the synth synthesizers for the string sounds, right. <clears throat> which are probably closer to sounding reasonable than the woodwinds. They don't seem to be able to get the woodwinds mm -hmm. or something about the overtones or something that makes it hard, yeah. hard for them to get, thankfully. It's, it's too bad people in the audience don't stand up and say, yeah. that's not real. Yeah, <laughs> well, they, they don't really know. <laughs> they you know? don't. So many motion pictures, <laughs> there's so many motion pictures are being made right now. This is a very busy field. That's one of the busiest things in this town. They're making a lot of motion pictures, lots of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, almost all of them, everyone I see, it's, a lot of it is, is electric music, yeah. you know? And then conversely, They'll have hundred-piece orchestras on some of them. So I don't know. Yeah. Let me ask you about some of the records you've been on. Um, early fifties uh, with Ken Hanna. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I did an album with Ken Hanna. I had had quite a few solos actually to play on that album, and that was a good band. Mm -hmm. Local band never never went anywhere. I think Ken was a. I learned this after I was on the band. He had, that he had been an arranger for uh, Stan Kenton, which I didn't know uh -huh. until afterwards. Uh, but uh, that was a good band. I, that's a good. It's a pretty good album. I, mm -hmm. Every 10, 15 years, I may get it out. And yeah. Play it again. Check it out. See if it's holding up. See if it's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you played with Buddy DeFranco. I'm yes, I did. An al well, I played, did an album with him. I, uh -huh. I didn't work with him in. in in clubs or concerts yeah. or anything, but I was called to do an album with him, and that was that was very good. That was a good good personnel. It was uh, Jimmy Rolls was on that. It was one of my favorite piano players, and uh, Barney Kessel was on it, uh, another favorite, and uh, Sweets Edison was on it, mm -hmm. and Buddy DeFranco and myself, and uh, I don't think I can remember who the bass player was right now. Somebody formidable. Though. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was fun. I enjoyed doing that. Didn't get. A lot of chance to do anything that uh, down really jazz album, mm -hmm. you know, as that was. <clears throat> I did a couple albums with a, a drummer out here who was with Woody Herman at one time. His name is Chuck Flores, excellent drummer, and he had a band. Uh, had Bobby Shue was the trumpet player, and it was and Bob Magnuson, an excellent bass player. Yes, and we did a couple albums with that band, and that was that was good. That I, we, I enjoyed that, and we played we played with that band out quite a bit. That was mm -hmm. pretty well organized. And then Jimmy Rose uh, 
Well, now this has to do, doesn't have to do with recording, though. You were talking about recording, but Jimmy, one of my favorite jobs was with Jimmy Rose when he had a quintet, and he was, at this time, he was very much into Wayne Shorter's music. And he had uh, arranged all of these Wayne Shorter originals for a trumpet and tenor and three rhythm. And we played at a, a club in town every Thursday for about eight months. Wow. And that was really something to look forward to. I was really busy at that time working in the studios, but it was really something to look forward to, to go in and play with that band. Conti Contoli was the trumpet player, and uh, uh -huh. it, it was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Was... Yeah, and there's some challenging music there, too, mm -hmm. from, a, from a soloing standpoint. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right, some uh, sophisticated changes yeah. that were demanding. You're uh -huh. right, challenging is the word. That's right. So that was fun, and a few things like that through the years. Didn't, don't have a lot of um, record solo space. Uh, the first solo I played on record was on a Billy May record mm -hmm. called Bacchanalia, and that was in 1953, I think. That was the first solo I played on a record. And then um, Ken Hannon was sort of in that period of time. And then Bethlehem hired me to do an album of my own. Uh, in 1955, and that's when they were still making a 10-inch LPs. Oh. So that's what it was, and that's the only album I ever did uh, on my own. Uh, and uh, through that, though, I got, uh, this is, you might enjoy this story. We used to have a, um, a little joke thing we'd do when we'd be playing or something, get together playing with friends just for fun, you know, or just hanging out or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the phone would ring, you say, oh, maybe it's Benny Goodman. Well, one time it was. <laughs> and, and he complimented me on that album. He had heard it uh -huh. in, in New York. And he subsequently hired me to, to sub on the, the movie, the Benny Goodman story, when they were making that movie, uh, to replace uh, Stan Getz. I didn't have to solo, but to yeah. replace Stan Getz, who had some court thing he had a peer at. For, I don't know what the details were, but... So I met him, and then, um, uh, uh, then around the same time, uh, I got a call from Woody Herman, and that was, was something I'd always wanted to do. I'd play, played in a lot of bands by then, and that was the one band I really wanted to play on, because that was a tenor player's band, you know? Yes, absolutely. The Four Brothers type band, and, uh, and so I agreed to join that band. And while I was in New York, New York rehearsing, we were there a week early before we were gonna start, the, I started on that band uh, uh, New Year's of 1955. And while I was in New York, a call was sent from, from L.A. back there to me from Betty Goodman. And uh, I subsequently went to a rehearsal of his. During the same time, I was rehearsing with Woody. In both in New York? Both in New York. It's a pretty exciting period of time for a young fellow. You know? I guess. And, uh, but even as much as I love Benny Goodman himself, his playing, uh, uh, Woody Herman's music was more what I had in mind. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I, I stayed with Woody. Yeah. I, I, so that was sort of fun. How long did you stay with Woody Herman? One, one year. Uh -huh. And um, uh, three months of that time, he broke down to an eight-piece band he had, and uh, with one tenor only, and I was picked to be the mm -hmm. tenor for that. So that, that was fun. We played uh, uh, locations with that, like yeah. in Las Vegas and, and Reno. And that was fun. Bill Harris, the famous trombone player on the early Woody Herman band, had just come back at that time mm -hmm. when I joined the band. For this is the new big band. And then he was on that band. So he, and he was an exciting player. And also on that band was another f famous guy, uh, Victor Feldman, had just come over and he was and this is the first time that Woody Herman had a vibraphone player since Terry Gibbs. Many years had gone by since he had a vibraphone player. And he, but he did. He had Victor. So that made the band sort of a little special. Yeah. You know? And then in the little band, Victor played drums. Uh -huh. with the little band. Uh, wh why was Benny Goodman calling to get you to sub for Stan Getz on the... Well, they were doing the Benny Goodman story? Well, yes. He had talked to me on the phone. Uh, complimenting me on the album, mm -hmm. and uh, let's see if I remember that, remember it right. I think he knew at that time 
that Stan had to take off this one day because this was set way in advance, his court okay. date. And it may have been the way, that may have been the way it did. Okay. He hired I guess him. I was just, I didn't know that Benny Goodman was that involved in the actual motion picture. That, I, that he was like a music contractor almost or that he was right in the middle of that. Well, I guess he was able to. Yeah. Actually, we didn't record anything. Uh, that that day I was there, uh -huh. we didn't do a whole lot, which is the way a lot of uh -huh. motion pictures are. A lot of times you just sit around all day. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't do a lot, I know, but uh, it was just an honor to be there. You yeah. know? I wonder if he liked the result of oh, that gee, movie. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Steve Allen, you know. Right. <laughs> he, he did fine, I guess. Yeah. It's uh, somewhat fictionalized oh, yeah. account. Oh, yeah. Hollywoodized the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Same way with the Glenn Miller story. Right. Remember, and Orchestra Wives, remember that movie mm -hmm. about the, and the, the, the gal who wanted to carry her vacuum cleaner on the road? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell there was no musicians involved in writing the script. <laughs> John Payne? Yes. <laughs> wow. Well, what are you up to these days? Well, I'm, um, I'm pretty much retired now. Uh -huh. I've uh, actually gone the, exactly the opposite direction than I was for those 20 years I was working in the studios. Uh, I don't really care about playing the woodwinds anymore at all. I don't mm -hmm. bother with them. Unless I know in advance something's coming up that I want to do, and then I'll have to spend a week or so woodshedding, so I'll be OK, you know? <clears throat> uh, I've been going to Japan for the last uh, mm, 20 years off and on uh, with a number of different bands, which I enjoy. I enjoy the trips in Japan. And um, so I do that usually once a year. Uh, this year, 99, I, at this point, I don't know that I'm going. But I do that. But I'm still playing as much as I can. I still practice. Mm -hmm. And I play with friends as much as I can. And I actually turn down most. Yeah. Uh, casual type engagements like dances or that kind of thing right because uh, I don't really enjoy them and I don't have to mm -hmm. I don't need need to do it <clears throat> so um, that's about it I'm just trying to keep myself together and uh, keep myself healthy so I can last a few more years well that's great yeah. the um, all the time you put into the studio is, is uh, helping pay off now I would imagine yes yes well I th we have uh, the young people don't really know how valuable it is, and that's why they do a lot of work unreported mm. off, off the record for underscale and things. Wow. Uh, but the musician's pension fund is a very uh, strong and, and stable fund, and I happen to be working, and a lot, of, a lot of the work I did, all the work I was doing was legitimate, and so contributions were made to that, so that pension is helping me a lot. That's good. And I'm also old enough that I'm getting my Social Security. Mm -hmm. And uh, so financially, I'm OK, because I, I do own my own home. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have a whole lot of expenses. <clears throat> so that allows me to be pretty choosy in taking in any jobs, yeah. which is pretty neat. That's nice. Yeah. You'll be able to pick and choose a little bit. Yeah, that's good. You don't have to go and do that wedding reception. Yeah. I still really do like to play the saxophone. and. Uh, and I, I play every week at least once with friends. We just get together and blow, and uh, I, I do still enjoy that. Uh -huh. Enjoy that. Were you in the in the studios when the uh, union became integrated? Uh, what, you mean the black and the white? Yes. The, the uh, two no, that was LA, that was that before, before my time. Uh huh. That was late forties, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, because I didn't get in the studios until the sixties. Oh, okay. See, I was yeah, I was. I was you were, scuffling for... You were on the road. Until I told you, I tried to figure out why, and then I took up the, right. those other doubles, and that, was, that turned things around for me. Mm -hmm. That really turned things around. But uh, no, I, I was not. As a matter of fact, wh when I joined the union, if you've, ever, you've probably never seen our union building. No. Well, it's been there for many, many years. But when I joined it, our union was in a different place. It was in downtown Los Angeles. And uh, there were two locals at that time, the black and white local. And uh, I went down and joined down there in L.A. That's, mm -hmm. that's way back. Not many people remember that. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I've been a member for 55 years of the union. 
You should be a lifetime member, is that right? I am, and yeah. it's sort of a humorous thing. They print in our local papers that when people have been a member 50 years, we invite them to come down and get their 50-year gold pin oh. and, and at a meeting, a general meeting, and then stand up, people give you a hand. I've never been invited. No kidding. I don't care because I don't really want the pin. Right. <laughs> what do I do with that? I wouldn't wear it, you know. <laughs> but it's sort of humorous. Do they, they give you a waiver on your dues when you get 50 years? Uh, <laughs> after you've been, a, when you become a lifetime member, uh -huh. you can, you can, you have a reduction in uh -huh. your, in your uh, yearly dues. You still have to pay as much. See, we're the only union in the world that, that I know of, except, no, I guess the actors uh, do, to pay work dues. Yes. A percentage of our income goes to the union. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was audited on my income tax one time because they couldn't believe that that was the case. Oh. Some uninformed right. guy from there. <laughs> and uh, and I, I just proved it to him, so it was no problem. But uh, you still pay that mm -hmm. to, as long as you work. Right. You still pay that. Yeah. All right. Well, I've been uh, fascinated to talk to you and get the oh, inside well, I, scoop on some of this stuff I haven't heard before. Well, I hope, I hope something was uh, of some interest, perhaps. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's the first time I've heard the kind of the inside story about the live TV and, mm -hmm. and all that. It's really great. Yeah, it's uh, uh, right now the, because of the motion pictures and because of, of, of theater. Mm -hmm. Theater is very good in Los Angeles now. Uh, and that's about the only thing it is very good now in Los Angeles. Yeah. So, uh, so the motion picture industry, uh, the musicians that are being employed, are really supporting our local union here. And um, uh, that's, that's, that's good. So because the guys that are in, on the inside of that field are, are keeping very busy now, and they're, mm -hmm. they're doing well. So that, that's all good stuff. And then, as I say, the theaters, <clears throat> the major theaters like the Schubert and so forth, are uh, they have a very good scales, too. So guys can make a really a nice living mm -hmm. by doing one of these shows that runs a year or two, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the best part of the business right now, <clears throat> I think. All right. Well, thanks for your time today. Well, nice Appreciate to meet you. It. Pleasure. Thank you.